Lander, just across the township line. Welcome, John. Glad you're here. Steve Mass has talked about you a million times. Oh. Yeah, he, he figures, he's, he thinks you're a rock star. <laughs> Why do you That was one of the biggest cowards that was over there. <laughs> I don't think so. December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. Do you remember where you were on December 7th, 1941? Well, it's in Bell Aircraft in Buffalo. I got a job. And I was there 30 days when uh, the Bell Aircraft, the guy's wife, came in with another group looking, and I was sewing cloth on for the airplane. I didn't know a fighter plane had cloth on it, but that's what I was doing. And she, she asked me something, and I said, I, 13 stitches of the inch and tie a knot every three inches, and it has to be tight. And boy, she said, you're doing good. The next night, the, the timekeeper came through and said, uh, we got bad news for you guys, but I won't tell you until they're ready to tell you. And a crew came through and fired us. They fired a thousand on the morning shift, a thousand on the second shift, and a thousand on the third shift. And uh, they just said, your work's unsatisfactory. So then I came home and I worked on the Warren for a whole month or so and then they got it straightened out and I went back to Bell Aircraft. And Bell Aircraft built the uh, P-39s. Yeah, P, yeah. What, did you work on those? Air yeah, Cobra, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I, I was, well, I'd done two jobs. At first, I, I told you, I sewed cloth on the aileron and the elevators and tail. And then when I got fired, I went back and I got into preparing the metal for spot weld, aluminum. And I was in that then the rest of the time. And when I went in the service, I had about 30, 40 girls working for me. For the P-39s that were made in Buffalo, uh, we ultimately went to the Soviet Union. And were you involved? Did you notice that they were putting the red stars on the aircraft at all? No, the only thing that I ever knew about that was uh, they put it over our intercon. They wanted uh, some guys to volunteer to go to Africa to work on those planes. They were shooting them so fast and so hard that the rivets they were using in the flash hiders on the barrels of the 30 calibers would burn off and then the flash hiders were swinging on the, on the barrel. And I went home and told my mother I was going to Africa. She said, you're going to stay here. So I never got to Africa. But I know a fellow that runs the ball bat factory there uh, Akeley out of Russell, uh, he was over there where they were taking our ships and giving them to the Russians. And he said, those Russians didn't know nothing. All they want to know is about gas and how to put ammunition in and not anything about landing them. And they just take off and they'd run out of gas and then, and then they'd use them for a pillbox. Did you enlist or were you drafted? Drafted. What was your reaction when you opened up the envelope? Well, I don't know. I guess I uh, <laughs> was growing into no knowing it was coming. Uh, Bell Aircraft gave me a uh, deferment, right. 180 days and six months. They were bringing girls up from Georgia. They were building a new plant. I forget what plane that was, a big one, up and learning the jobs that they were going to need. And we were training them and sending them back and get them again. Well, when that ran out, I was ready to go. and. I went, told them I was leaving. No, we want you to take another six months. So I said, no, all my friends are gone. I'm not going to say no more. So I went. And how long were you there at training camp in Florida? 17 weeks. And so the ship took you to a place called Casablanca. Casablanca, seven days. We had to stay out in the ocean for two, day, two or three days because the French sunk their fleet in their own harbor and they were going to get one or two boats in there, and there was boats in there, so we had to wait our turn out there, and then the boatman brought us in. <laughs> then they loaded us, and they took us to Oran. <coughs> All right. And that, that's in the northern Africa. We went across the top of the Sahara Desert. I think we were two or three days. It was about eight tunnels 
on that trip, and we had to wear gas masks on school because they were burning soft coal, and when you come out, you were about the color of the coal, I'll tell you. Uh, we took an English boat from Iran to Naples. We got halfway across. Our Air Corps could go from Africa halfway across and return without refueling. And we already had an airport in Italy down south. They would send theirs out and meet them at halfway. And boy, at halfway, we got a call from our boat. A submarine had been noticed and the Air Corps come in and they dropped bombs and they blowed it out of the water. Do you have any idea what you were, what, what your mission was? I didn't even know where I was. <laughs> Well, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it, if you want to know. When that boat pulled in there, all the boats were blowed up laying. And they told us, run from the boat here to the fan tail of that boat and slide down to the other ship and right, go to the end of that fag tail. And then there's a floating dock you can slide down to on the ground. And I never seen so many balloons in there. It was dark at night. And the anti-aircraft fire was terrible. And there was one or two planes up there. and. And they finally loaded us. Well, they, the one that was up there came down right head first, sunk our ship right in the harbor, and then they put us on the railroad track, and we went, I don't I have no idea where we were or how far we went, but they finally stopped it, and they said we were being strafed by the Germans. So they throwed us off and run us into the woods, and then they loaded us on trucks and took us somewhere. I don't know where it was. So it was at night. And uh, they took three or four of us. We, I didn't know anybody. And, and I was in the group. And, and the sergeant come down. He was mud from one end, the other big chew at the back. And, and uh, he picked me for some reason. And he said, now I'm going to take you with me. And I want you to identify what I, where I point and tell you. He said, because we're going to bring a company in tonight after dark. And I want a platoon here and a platoon there and a platoon there. And then I want to be able to take you and take me down where they're at. I said, I've never been over here. I don't know anything about the police, but it don't matter. So he got us in the road. There was, I think, 10 of us. And he says, uh, count one to two. One, two, one, two, one, two. He says, okay. He says, uh, number ones, you're the mortarman. You get on that side of the road. Number two, you're the machine gunners. Get over here. Well, if you're smart, oh, they all got over there because they're going to shoot in the deflated position. <laughs> so he called us back up there again, and he said, okay, forget the numbers, and he walked out and said, you, 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 and I'm one of them, you're a machine gunner. And I had never shot a 30 caliber air cool machine gun, and never taken it apart or nothing. If I remember, I each carried uh, two boxes of M1 machine gun bullets wrapped in wool blankets so they would rattle, and beside your own equipment, and they, these boxes went to the machine gunners, and your stuff stayed with you. So I got up there, and, and you couldn't hardly see anything. And, and he stopped, me and another guy, and he said, well, see that fellow laying there, right there? That's going to be your home. And so this fellow was with me. He stopped there, and I stood there, and they said, now I'm telling you what your job is. You said, you come with me. And, he, and now that's the front. <laughs> he, he walked right toward the German line. I, I, I would say probably 100 yards was a stone pile with a lot of second growth brush in it. He said, I want you to stand in here and keep watch and listen. And if you hear any noise or see any movement, you let these guys know, because that's the Germans out there. So I don't know how it was. He got me back in the middle of the night, and I went over to my hole. It's going to jump down in there. It was no hole there. The guy that dug it was a slit trench. It was about that wide, and just the length of his body, and he was laying flat in it. So the rest of the night, we dug her down another foot, and uh, we stayed there. And one of the guys took me for a walk one morning while they laid a smoke screen to see what the battlefield was. And uh, I, I was running out of water because I love to drink water, and I was thirsty. And it was a stream, and I thought, I'm going to fill up here. No, he says, no, look what you're doing. He says, that's a German laying there, and you got your thermos bottle right between his legs so the water. He says, well, let's, let's move to a different position. Well, then they gave us tablets to put in the, in the jar and leave it two hours before you drink it. That was the disinfectant? 
Pardon? The tablets were to disinfect it? Yeah, yeah. I, I carried them for over a year. Yeah. You didn't dare drink any of their water over there. You were there at Monte Casino. I moved up there from when I was on that train that day, and we moved in. Then we was dumped in the field full of foxholes. And as they called your four numbers, you answered it back, and you jumped out and ran, and he told you where, and jumped in the truck. And the minute that truck, I think it was 10 men in it, that truck pulled off and another one pulled in. They were taking them men just like that to the front line up to Mussolini's farm. And we got up there on top of the hill, and they had a guy riding the truck with a driver with anti-aircraft gun. And he said, now, if you hear an artillery shell go over, you listen to it. And he said, if it's close, and, and the driver hits the brakes, you jump off and you go towards where it came from, he hit the ground as fast as he can, because they're going to blow this truck up. And it wasn't long, and one came sailing through, and we unloaded right there, and we, I... Well, I think we probably got 100 yards from it when one hit our dead center and just tore that truck all to pieces. Wow. Then we walked from there to Mussolini's farm, and uh, to give you some idea what that was, we were in platoons, and a platoon normally has about 35 men. Each platoon had 1,300, and they fed around the clock. I, I watched the truck come in there with a load of pork chops and it wasn't even wrapped. They dumped them there with a dump truck right in the barn and they kept right on cooking. And then from there on, I went to the front. Yeah. Well, I didn't go to the front there. I, I went where you're, you asked me a question. It was up out of the woods on the top of the hill. And there the monastery was. And then whenever they give the word, here come the planes. We counted about 3,000 that day. And we could see them coming in squadrons and see how many is hurt. They're coming way down, smoking, and some's not coming back. And so we kind of scratched it in the dirt. They bombed it steady fire for, oh, I'd say 12, 14 hours steady. And they never even changed the appearance of it. The walls were 12 foot thick, concrete. What was your experience like in Anzio? What was it like? Well, I was scared to death, but I didn't know nothing, and maybe it was why that I wasn't too smart. I don't know. Uh, they just took us out there in this field, and it was flat, and uh, like I said, that hole in there, and uh, there was a couple of guys from Warren. One guy that I knew his voice, he was on my left, Donna. He kept hollering at night. Hey, that, shoot, uh, throw a grenade, throw a grenade. And so I'd, well, I had the whole 50, 60 of them in a pile in the hole here, and I'd pull and I'll pull a pin on it, and you know, I'll have a fire in the hole and throw it, and I never seen anybody. Well, that kept that up for oh, a couple of weeks, it, off and on, not steady. And then this one night, I was with Jack Earl from Pittsburgh, and uh, this voice come on. Uh, Sam, you got a cigarette in the night. And uh, I said, where, where is this guy? He said, don't stick your head up because he's out front where he shouldn't be. He says, we're here. And he kept saying that. And like what you got back to you, that it, it started worrying me to death. I figured, well, if I got to get killed, I might as well do it right now. And uh, so I, what we had to do, in behind, we'd take a piece of sod about that big, shake the dirt off, and had grass on it or whatever the foliage was on the ground, and set that on your helmet. And now you'd get down and look at the gun, so your face hits the ground, you're looking just that high above the ground, but that sod's up here, what he's seeing. And uh, finally, about the second time I did that, I saw the guy. Oh, he was about half again as far as the mirror to that wall. The hole in that Mauser rifle looked to be about that big. <laughs> and uh, I told, told Jack, I said, you know, I, I don't know what to say, but either him or me, he's got to go, because it's killing me just sitting here thinking about it. So finally I checked and made sure my rifle was loaded, and made sure his was loaded, and made sure the pistols was laying there, and the machine gun was hung out of the way. And I said, now when I get ready and I count three, I'm going to come up just above the ground, and I'm going to let him have about five shots just as fast as that M1 will shoot, because that's semi-automatic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did. And I got back in the hole, 
Jack says, uh, did you hear that bullet come in? I said, no, why? He said, don't move because I'm going to show you. And it went, missed my ear by about three inches and it went right in the ground like that. When he shot and, uh, oh God, then that scared the pagan out of me. And I thought, that, one of us has got to go. So I waited and checked the guns again and I told him, I said, I'm going to do that one more and it will come a little higher, but I'm going to come shooting. And uh, you get ready with your gun because seven times is all they can shoot because they know eighth one, you're unloaded. And then I shoot seven, you give me a rifle and I'll shoot the eighth one. If he charges, I got seven more to shoot him. And uh, I think he raised up. I don't know if he shot, but I shot then. I knew I hit him because I heard him holler. And uh, so we sat there a minute. And now I'm even worse than I was then. If he's got a hand grenade or if I want to use one on him, I've got to either hold it till almost going to go off, or if I throw it and got plenty of time, he's going to pick it up and throw it right back at me. Mm -hmm. So I figured seven was the count, and I got it ready, and when I hollered seven, I hollered fire in a hole, but I think he, he, he was probably hurt, and what he was looking at, he could have seen the smoke from that maybe, I don't know. But I, I remember him throwing his hands up like that, like he was feeling for it. I said to Jack, I said, be ready if he throws it in, we're done. But he's filled for it, and about the time I said it, it blew up, and he, he had it in his hand, and that was the end of that. Yeah. Gosh. Did you ever, did you ever write that story home back to your, your parents? Did they? I mean, that's an amazing story. No, I never told my folks anything. From uh, Anzio, you then went up the Italian coast to Cisterna. Yeah, it uh, wasn't too far ahead of us. Yeah, that's, that was a pretty good sized city. Mm -hmm. I know there were three, three divisions side by side of us. The 36th, 30, 30, uh, 45th, and the 3rd. And then the uh, British probably had some in there. You actually lost one of your guys right there at Cisterna. You mentioned the fact that uh, one of the guys was sitting writing a letter. Oh, yeah. I suppose he's maybe another division, I don't know, but it was swampy, and we was crashing through it. I saw him sitting up there, and I see he had the paper in his hand, and of course the artillery was flying bullets and everything, and I finally looked up, and he's still holding his letter like there to his hands, and his head is missing. And, and uh, we moved on that night. We had 198 men that had at least 30 days combat, and that... Uh, after that dark, when it was just getting dark, whatever time of day, because we were on any kind of time you want to call it, and uh, we, we counted 18 men. Mm. Of course, someone was lost probably and didn't know where we were. And uh, there was one guy sitting by where he is, and I'm sitting here, and the captain was there, and the rest of the crew was in there, but you could look out through the brush. The mountain or the land was high. Right up there was two or three German tanks going back and forth on the highway. <laughs> and so we, we were really quiet and sane. We didn't know what to do. And uh, like this guy here, he started digging a hole to, to get into. And so I was over here at l l different angles, and I was digging a hole. Well, I had been digging, and I was up out resting. And I had my hands, I don't know, like this, something in your lap while you're sitting flat. And uh, everything was going good. And all of a sudden, I thought I heard piece of chain rattle. It would just jingle. It didn't sound familiar with the rest of it. And just no more than heard it went Bruh! And then it all quieted right down and the guy who was with him, he says, uh, hey, I think B Bishop is hit. And so uh, I thought, oh, I, I saw them bullets go through here. <laughs> I have two or three bullet holes through my underside of the sleeve here and a couple through here from sitting with my jacket hanging off to the side. And uh, so he said, we went over and checked him out and he was hit right here. And he said to the captain, he said, uh, I, I want to go back where we came from because I'm hit. And the captain said, no, you can't go. You can't get back through the minefield. You won't know where you are. But I heard later that he did know how to get there. How he did, I don't know. But uh, as he got back there, just right where we started out to push, he dropped dead. And the guy, our company was picked to go there. We all got on half tracks and 
divided into two sections because they knew the road. We didn't know even where we were. And, and ours was, now that I know, we were on a kind of a low side and this one was up here. At a certain point, we split going into Rome. Our track, we come in where I was sitting on the back corner of the, behind the passenger and our order was to keep your canteen water tank with the cap loose because we're going through fire, they've set the woods on fire, so if you see your buddy's jacket on fire, dump it out and put it out. And uh, all of a sudden it was just a roof. And what? That sounded funny. And I'm sitting right up on top of it, and I could hear something running. I looked out and I saw this tree. Did they shoot me in the ass and I didn't feel it? And it went right below me. He hit a water tank, one of them five gallon water tanks, and shot it out. But the truck I read kept right on going. And we came in, I've seen it on television a half a dozen times, where the last aqueduct hit the end of the city limits of Rome. Our, our uh, half track pulled into that, and then the people started coming around and telling us that the Germans had left. And so we stayed there that the rest of that day. And that night, we got orders pack up and come back the same route you went in <laughs> and, and and go back to where you came from and we did and then when we got back there we stopped and another outfit took our place they went into Rome and we rested we went down to see where the Pope was and then we were turned loose and uh, I volunteered to take my machine gun sections into this building it was a Bureau of Aeronautics and they figured Axis Sally was in there. She always sang us the songs out on the beach. And uh, so I took them, I had 12 guys, so every time we'd clean the room, we'd leave them in until we get the whole, f there was three floors, I think. Well, in there, I, I made myself a sandwich. I gotta put this in. And one of my men said, hey, Sarge, where'd you get the sandwich? I said, down there. Well, would you go down and make me one? I said, yeah, nobody stopped me, so I went down. And I told him, get the bread and do this and that, and I'll get you some meat. So I took a fork and I'm stiffened down that barrel of juice and meat. And, and finally, I knew I was bone hitting the tank. It wasn't my fork. And I thought, i got to get that up and see if I can break off a chunk. And I got it up out, and he's standing there with his bread. I got the sheep's head cut off right here, split right through the middle this way, and all his teeth and his eye hung down here. Oh, God. He saw that. He dropped that bread on the floor. And, he ran up. and I had one squad with me, and I said, well, let's sit down here and rest and watch what's going on. So we did a few minutes and looked down the road, and here come a Jeep with a red, red lights on and somebody standing up in the thing. And I said, uh, get ready. I said, it's an officer. And when he gets right out there, we'll jump up and give him a highball. So we were all set. And when he got just right, I said, OK, get up and get at attention. And we give him a highball. And he hollered, stop this Jeep right now. And the driver, he stopped it. And he had MPs in front. He had MPs in back and the MPs on the side. And he jumped off and come over where we are. And he said, you guys sit down. And he said, I don't want you saluting me. I'm going to salute you right now. You're doing the fighting and I'm doing the thinking. <laughs> and we talked a minute or so. He was really nice, a nice appearing guy. And uh, he said, you sit right here until you get your orders to go because you need a rest. Jacob, isn't it a darn shame? All the sweet old American summer atmosphere which the boys are missing now. Just imagine sitting out on the old uh, back porch in a sweet old rocking chair, and listening to the birds at twilight. Instead of that, the boys are over there in the hot, sunny desert. But when we were on Anzio, she was down front close enough, and they had that whole place as big as it was. But did you tell me, or somebody tell me how big that was? From that point of the beach on the front was 14 miles to that point. And from here, back that way, I always was told it was seven miles, but they said it was nine. That's how much ground we had. And somewhere in there, she had this up and it's all where. Any new song that come out in the United States, she'd play it. Or if we sent a, a, a four-man squad out to pick up a prisoner or spot how, how much firepower they got, and one of them got hurt or captured, 
the next morning, she would give you his name. She would tell you how bad he's hurt, he's taken care of, and then she'd play a song. And then they'd go off the air. That's, that's what that was. For three months, we'd listen to that all the time. And then somebody else would get on and tell you what they were doing to your girlfriends back home. <laughs> that wasn't too great. <laughs> Did you believe him? Well, I think believe I, her? I think I do now. But. <laughs> About halfway back to, uh, to Naples, and uh, I, I was coming down with my men, and there's a guy sitting on a post over in the water by the end of the, the walkway to the boat. And I thought, look at that guy. Hey, gosh, I know that guy. And uh, I walked over to him and I said, hey, Alan, how are you doing? Alan Larson was sat next to me in school. He graduated one year ahead. He was in charge of that boat, and I was loading my men on it. No kidding. You were part of Operation Dragoon. We were at a town named Salt. It wasn't very big. And uh, uh, it was a lot of warships, I think, in the continent where the rivers ran. You couldn't go very far at a time. and. Uh, I, I just don't know. I could see Marseille over to the left, and uh, we went by uh, uh, jeeps. Finally, about the second day, 150, they said, 150 jeeps and trailers moving the whole outfit north, right up the line. And I'm, I don't know how I got there. I was always in the wrong place anyway. I was sitting on the front jeep, and we had a, a pole or uh, iron, uh, what do I want to say, uh, angle iron, right from the front, right up like that, right over the top of the Jeep, braced down. It had notches in it, and the reason that was, if somebody had a wire across the road, that would break it. So I'm sitting there, we didn't have a wire that night, and uh, we was coming down this mountain trail, and real slow with them night lights, which didn't light up. You could only see a, a symbol on the back of a car of the light. And uh, all, you could hear those trucks, or those jeeps, and bouncing. And all of a sudden, to my left, I could see it off at a distance, a flat, uh, like a, a, a lander swinging like this. And I hollered to the driver. I said, let's take a look down there. Look at that fellow. And he's tried to flag you down something. And then he commenced to holler. And I told the driver, <laughs> I said, I can't see nothing in the front of us, but this road and it's darker and dark ever thinking to be, and you better stop. And he spiked her. Well, the guy behind him, he kind of bumped him a little bit because he wasn't going that fast. And I went to get off and I hung onto that rod and I come down and put my foot on the road. There wasn't any road. They'd blow the center column of the bridge out. We would have went 150 feet right straight down oh the end of it. Oh my gosh. This week in Army history, the military recognizes extraordinary heroism. The award of the Distinguished Service Cross was established on July 9, 1918. Recipients have displayed selfless acts of valor in the face of the enemy, often courageously facing overwhelming odds with devotion, especially to fellow soldiers. Records of the award range from a mortally wounded army cook who refused medical care and urged medics to help others less injured, to a young soldier who put himself in harm's way allowing another soldier to render first aid to surviving comrades. You were awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for your actions taken at Noroi. Uh, talk about that. You, you, you were awarded the incredible Distinguished well, Service Cross. I, I can tell you right through it. We, <laughs> we, we come out of the woods before daylight and we stopped and each one got our orders like you would get uh, first and first and second platoon. You're going to take over here. <coughs> Third platoon. You're going to be reserved. Staten, your platoon's going to be firepower for them when they need it. So that was all set, and uh, the time was something like 6:30, and they synchronized our watches. And well, we hadn't come out of the woods yet, so they could shoot us. And uh, I went ahead of them because I, I, I knew where I was supposed to go, but I didn't know what's out there. I went out, and here's the bank, just like this, uh, an angle about like that, right straight down. And, and little bushes like that, and just junk. And I think maybe it was a gravel pit where they'd cut the side of it off, and I'm coming right to the top and going down it, 
And I looked about going to my right, and there was a Jeep over there about 100 yards. The driver still sitting in it, and it's still smoking. It uh, burned his arms and head off, and he's still hanging on the steering wheel. So I don't want to get no more in there, so I ran back to the woods and told the men, hold up. i got to figure out how we get out here or explain to you what you're going to get. And I'm talking to them, and this guy's standing beside a tree, and when he hit me in the ass, a good wallop with a riding crop. I wonder I didn't turn around and bust him one, because I, I, how the hell did I know he was there? And he said, you know, soldier, you don't retreat. The American Army never retreats. I said, I didn't tell you we were retreating, but I got to tell you I pulled back to get a better choice. You go up and take a look down that bank. And so he backed off. He didn't, didn't sass me none. And uh, finally I got the guys and told him he hit it sitting down, slide down it, because you got to go back and get your stuff, you'll lose it. Well, we went over and we lost about two-thirds of it. So I just stopped right at the foot of the hill. There's no shooting there. So they went back and gained what they could. I don't think we ever got all of it. And we come up down there and this stone wall went down there between two pieces of property, I imagine. And uh, I had the guy lay down until I looked to see where I could put a gun. Hell, you can't set a machine gun anywhere. So I stuck my head right even to the end of the wall. And it looked like a mowed lawn there. And right over in there where the shooting was, and I could hear men hollering and yelling. Here stood this guy, just standing there with his hands up in the air, giving orders must be, I couldn't hear no words, to the man that was, the officer was one that I thought I knew just by his profile. And all of a sudden, there was just a hell of a shot of shots, and down he went. Well, that's, I, that's all I remember of him going down, and I, I don't remember anything else. And uh, all of a sudden, how many seconds it was, I don't know now. Uh, this one of my uh, either one of my uh, non cops come up or else one of the gunners crawled right up alongside him here. Here's the wall, and I'm like back here. And right here he says, What's the matter, sorry, you chicken? And I don't remember answering him. He, he, I remember him moving. He got up here, and as he got right there, I heard that same noise. He rolled right over and rolled right on top of me, and they shot him right over the ear. Well, I, I didn't know any of this stuff, see, except I knew he was shot. So I backed the guys up quite a ways away from the end of that. And I thought, no, I, I can't shoot him, but I think I'll throw a hand grenade over. I was getting so out of hell for hand grenades. And, uh, I, but I wanted to keep it on the ground, you know, and I don't know what kind of trees it was. But anyway, I got back, I said, hug up against that stone wall because there's going to be a lot of shit in the air. And I throw that hand grenade just over where I, I thought this all the uh, German was. Now what I think it could have been, either he was killed with a hand grenade or else he ran after he shot this guy. Now I went in right now. My mind is nothing I got <coughs> on any mind. But right over there is a machine gunner and I can see them bullets going right down there in where the GIs were. Now I, I do have no idea what told me to go out there. What the hell did I want to go out there and face a machine gun for? I don't know. But I, and I remember some mortars falling and I ran out there. I remember hitting the ground and I'd practiced that for years and even trained it that way. I come up with that M1 and I, I fired about six or seven shots right into, there was a hole in the bank and the machine gun was dug in there. There's two guys on it. And they were shooting that way, and of course, see, I come in the wrong side. They never probably seen me coming, and I, I killed both of them. And uh, as soon as I seen that was over, I, I never stopped, because I had always told my guys, you displace one gun at a time. Don't two of you come together and both get killed at the same time. Take your time and get up to that building. Then I come up to this building, scared to death. I mean, I, had, I was scared, but I, my brain don't work. And uh, I come right up to the side of it, and I stopped, and I'm looking at the terrain to see what I should do. And here's what happened. Uh, something like this. Tapping me on the back. And, what the hell? I turn around. Here's a swastika on his helmet. German's got me right there, captured right now. <laughs> and he's talking in German, and I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, no, German kaput. Um, Buku American soldat. And then a few other words, and I don't know if he understood what I said. I didn't know what he said. And then finally I said, give me your gun. Vuku, all I mean, kaput. And the damn fool handed me his gun, 
and I took that gun and I threw it like that up. And I laid out here on the ground, and he laid down, and everybody said, well, you lay him down. I didn't want him running, so I put my foot on him, and I stood there a minute, and I thought, now what am I going to do? And I took a couple steps forward to look past the end of the garage, and I could see about that much of a tire, just a piece of a tire, and I could see a man's leg right there. And, uh, oh, oh, oh. And I, I stuck my head out again, and the, the shells were about that long. I think there's four in a clip. He was sticking them in that gun, and I figured that's the end of the aircraft because I wasn't familiar with it. So I didn't tell this jerk I got my foot on it. So I reached up and unhooked another hand grenade and let the clip come off and counted seven, and I just took it like this and I flipped it. And it went right out around there, and it rolled right under the guys. They never seen it. Well, the next thing, in about three seconds, it blew. And I seen one guy just a little bit higher than the eaves on the, on the building in a piece of tire. Well, it stunned me. But my brain's not working. And I look right down there in front of me, and there's a ditch. There's about seven turns down there, and they're all shooting them guys out there in the field. Bang, bang, bang. And I put in a new clip, and then I, I picked every one of them off that I could see, and I thought, no, I'm going to get out of here. There's, there's got to be somebody alive around here. So instead of going back, I took her right up the hill, probably, oh, I don't know, be twice as far as this building is here. And, uh, I got up there and I stopped and looked and there's nobody. I didn't see nothing, didn't hear nothing. And here's the corner of the building. I was trained, don't ever go out to the corner of the building, to go up and keep the rifle at hard port and stick your head out. Well, I, I, naturally I got to go ass backwards. I got mine down like this and I got my head out here. Well, the first thing was out was the gun. The gun went about, I'd say, six inches and it came back. And I stopped and I, that's pretty soft. So I didn't move the gun too far. I threw my head out real quick, and that German did say, him and me both with our helmets on hit right in our forehead. And he had his this way, and I had, so he turned. I knew if he turned and, you know, get his gun on, he couldn't shoot me until he did. I pulled the trigger and got him right there. And uh, stood there a few minutes and got up above on that same road. Here come a, a Army 6 by down, like our Army 6, was a German driver and they weren't going only about 10 miles an hour and I noticed on the back was a cannon of a barrel about that long and it might have been a mortar or something or I don't know what it was about that big around so anyway I figured I'm going to get him so I got in and then and, and of course it did that and the driver jumped out and I missed him so I'm standing there now I don't see nobody where am I going to go God I don't dare go back because I've come through the enemy lines I, I'm not even in the American line and I stood there, leaned against the wall like this, and, and there was a, right along the building here was an outside stairway. I'd say it was probably four or five feet wide, and hand st made stone, you know, real coarse, and heavy doors. And I stood there looking at that, and all of a sudden, that door just moved. And at the same time, I heard a squeak. And I've always used this. You ever hear that inner sanctum on television where the squeaking hinge was? That went through my mind just that fast, you know. I got the M1 rifle and stuck it down there, bang, 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 bang. Put about four right in the cellar. Then you heard singing, hollering, and yelling, and I thought probably killed half of them. And I stopped, and I put a new ground in. And I stood there, and pretty soon I heard again. And I could hear noise, Vincent, but I don't know German. So I gave him three more just for good notice. And, I, and then I hollered and I said, Puk on American soul out. All man kapuk, come on up out. Pretty soon the door opened up and, and here come a guy out with a rifle. And I says, bang, rifle, throw it over there. So he threw it over there on the pile. And he kept coming. They, they kept coming. I didn't call him. Come on out. And finally, the last one was an officer. I had the rifle right on him because, you know, he could shoot me because he'd have a pistol. And uh, he come right up there, and he, he didn't do nothing. And uh, his hand moved, but he, he didn't give me any sanction that he was going to shoot me there because I had to pull that trigger three times before he got that pistol out. And he had the pistol right by the sight at the end of the barrel, like that. And he's half against me, and I stepped over to him, and he put it on and said something in German and handed me the pistol, and I took it with the pistol grip 
back, and I looked at it, and I figured it's probably loaded, and I stuck it in my harness, and he said something again. And those other guys are jabbering over here, and uh, finally he reached down to his belt and done something. Uh oh, I'll keep that ready. He may have another pistol, and there's nothing to stop him from shooting me. He's that close. And he unbuttoned his belt and he took the holster off, and he turned it around and handed it to me. Wow. And he said something in German, and I stuck it in my shirt. And uh, he just stood there. That was the last one, and the other guys were there. And I said, uh, uh, any of you guys speak any kind of English or understand it? And one young fellow said, yeah, a song. And I said, okay, tell him to get in a column of twos right here, stay in twos, and go right back down to that, that building down there, because there's a lot of Americans down there, and they'll take care of you. But should you step off of that sidewalk or path, I'll kill every one of you. I've had it. And God, they give an order, and the guys come on, they got in there. And I, they left. Oh, now I'm telling you, I got so damn weak, I don't care, ashamed of it and scared. I sat on my ass right there on the corner and leaned right up against that building. And I don't know where those guys went to. I never seen another man for the next hour. And, and they found me sitting up there. I, I had burnt completely up. Now I'm telling you, I, I was no hero. I was in a position where you couldn't stop. This is riveting. <laughs> Boy, I think God was telling me exactly what to do, because I didn't know enough to do it. But this other time, I uh, was in this building, and the German medic came in to fix the, a couple wounded. But he didn't come to fix them. He came to tell me a message that I had better get out of there and, and take all my men with me, because they were going to blow those three houses apart in good English. And when he got through, then he said, now, I want you to turn and watch me. I'm going to walk right down that path. And when I go out of sight, I'll not have a shot fired at you, but one will come through that doorway. The war is on. Well, he went. And all of a sudden, pow! Something hit the wall and the dust of fogging like that and some stuff. And I swear that I could look back on <laughs> it. But I was so scared and mixed up, I turned my head like that and I had something on my tongue. I wish I'd have spit it out. I spit it out of my hand and threw it on the floor. And I couldn't move those guys, so I went to the window and jumped out. There's two guys out there. They're not hurt and they wanted to go with me. So we went to the end of the third house and they blowed the second house apart when one of them slate roofs with the red shingles about that long of clay or whatever they're made. Once you unhook them, they'll all just come off. And uh, we got to the end of that, and this one kid, I don't know who he was till later, I found out he was a barber from New York. He said, uh, see that wheel bar down there by the road? I'm going to get down and get under that. Oh, it was a long damn thing, handmade, a big wheel like that. You could hardly, I don't know how they moved it. So he went down, got under that, and the other guy turned around up here was a building about that square. I thought it was one of our portable uh, toilets, but they wouldn't be smart enough to have that. They'd probably use it for their tools. Uh, for the garden. So he went up there. Now I'm, I've got a front yard here. Nothing. But way over there on that far side was a garden, and I'm sure that was tobacco about that high. There was about three or four rows of it, big leaves. I'm going to get in that looking back this way. And uh, so I did. Well, pretty soon, here I could hear these hobnailed shoes coming on the cobblestone. Here come 24 Germans, fixed bayonets, column of fours, up the road. Just nonchalantly, they seen that guy on the wheelbar. What did he do? He jumped out in front of them, pulled out his pistol, stopped them. The German jabbed it to him. He jabbed it to the Germans, and they, they fooled around with the pistol. Finally, the German took the pistol. He opened it up, see if it was shells. There were shells in it, so he shut it, put it up, shot him right between the eyes, right here, right under the helmet. And they had a party. And so then they went by, they went by me about 20 feet, but they didn't see me in there for some reason. And they were gone, well, time, I, it was so long because it was all day and this happened. And uh, here they come again, coming down. They, they got by me and they went down, they had another little thing doing on this kid they'd shot and kept on going. So I thought, I don't dare move because if they've seen me laying here and I would move in any direction, then they'll know I'm awake. So I gotta be petrified. So I'm laying there. 
for another couple hours. And I'll, I'll, I'll admit this, that I pissed my pants so bad that I was wet from here down to clear my pant leg. I had laid there for over five hours, right out there in the sun, and, and the artillery had fallen on me and nothing hit us. Well, anyway, pretty soon I looked across the road, oh, probably 30, 40 feet. Here was a pig about that long, just a little pig, and the damn thing was pumping with these nose, you know, like they do. Come right across the road, come right over to the tobacco plants where I laid. It come right up, and I got my rifle like this. I never moved it. It was laying on the ground, the gun. What that damn pig come up, and he jumped right over and took my, his nose under there, and he flipped that rifle. Oh, boss, me to you. No, I ain't got nothing. And that German, he seen it, and he brought that whole bayonet crew up there, and they stopped. They didn't get off the road, they stayed there. And he came up. I'm still laying in the same way, scared to death, and I don't know what to do. Now, <coughs> my brain is not working. I mean, I don't even think it's hooked up to me. But he put that bayonet right here, right, right there on my ba uh, shoulder blade. I, I could feel it when I went and hit the bone, the heft of it. They weighed nine pounds. And he started talking German, and they was having a big party. And uh, I just laid there, and I thought, uh oh if he sticks that bayonet through there, he's got to shoot me to pull it out, because he can't pull it out of that bone. Now, if he don't do that, then he moves over a little bit, pulls the trigger, and shoots me in the heart, and I'm dead anyway. I mean, these are all going through about 90 miles an hour, you know. And uh, so I laid there, and uh, he kept talking German. And uh, finally, I thought I heard him say in a conversation, use the word kaput. Now, I used to use it, and I've heard it, and it always meant like I'd see a soldier laying there, he's kaput or something like that. And uh, so I thought, well, I'm probably dead. Well, without moving the rifle now, he stepped right across over me. And I'm, <laughs> I'm laying on their shoulder, and he said something, and they kind of snickered. And how far he pulled his foot back, but he sure kicked me one hell of a shot right under the ear. And when it did, took my helmet, went right across the ditch, clear across the road, and went down where that pig come from. And then they had a party, they had a laugh, and, and he picked the gun up and stepped over me the other way, and away they went. So now I'm laying there, they're going back up this way. Now they're going to have to come back. Well, I waited till it got towards dusk, and they hadn't come back. So I thought, I, I'm going to stay around here, and I'm going to keep low so there's no, no showing of my body moving. I'll stay even on the ground till I get over to those houses that they didn't blow up, and then I can stand up. So I got over there, finally it took quite a while crawling on my belly, and, and uh, I got to that window I jumped out of before that morning, and this guy said, halt. And I, I halted. And he said something. He used three or four words. I did not have the password, so I didn't know what the cosign was. And uh, he said, who is that? I said, it's Sergeant Stanton of the machine gun section of the L Company. And there was a pause. And he says, no, can't be. Stanton was killed at 3 o'clock this afternoon. So he had me move ahead a little bit, and he asked me the same thing, and I said it again. And he says, uh, Stanton was killed at 3 o'clock this afternoon, so I'm just standing there, and I thought, are we all dead, and, and, and do the <laughs> dead all talk to each other, the, the whole works? And uh, so we got the end of some more words, and he let me get to the window, and I said, you don't have to guard me. I said, I give some other names with the outfit and Captain Yates and everything. So he said, come on up in. I got in, and he frisked me again, and I still had my rifle, and I think he took that in. I didn't have nothing. And I said, well, where's Captain Yates? Is he here? And he said, yeah. And I couldn't believe he would be, because that's where I had been that morning. I thought he was probably dead somewhere else. And uh, so he took me down the cellar, just a small cellar, and there was no, nothing there, and he got me in one place, and he just get down on your hands and knees now. And he, he knew where the, it was a table about that big with blankets over, and the captain was under there reading the map. And he got right over next to that, and he said, called him by name, he's captain, and he says, uh, I have Sergeant Stanton right here, and he wants to talk to you. Don't you send Stanton in here? He was killed at 3 o'clock, and you've got the wrong guy out there. Well, no, God, I, I wasn't sure where I was. And, and uh, so we went back and forth a while, and then finally he says, oh, he proved to me he's Stanton. 
So uh, the captain says, well, right, let him part the blanket and come in. So I parted the blanket and come in. The captain seen me. He says, Harz, I'm sure glad to see you, but I want you to say this. And in his hand, he had a, well, no, it's a rosary about that big. And I knew he was Catholic, and he had come from look down below Italy, and uh, he had left his gas mask in the place where he was, and it had been shot right in the head, and his wife pictures in there, and it hit her right between the eyes, and so he never, never brought the picture out to carry around, and so I knew he was Catholic, and I knew this was Rosary, and I said, uh, how did you get this? Well, he said, just before that guy told me your last name, Satin, well, it's sure down here, a woman reached through that blanket with this rosary in her hand, and she said to me, she said, sir, you take that and you enjoy it, and it's yours. And she pulled her hand back, and then this guy let me get in there. And he showed me the sight. He hollered that guy outside, catch that woman that just left here. I want to talk to her and thank her for what she gave me. And the guy says, I've been here over eight hours, and there's been no women in this house, and I haven't seen one all day, so it's certainly there wasn't no woman in there with her hand. Well, he had the rosary anyway. Well, now i got to close the story down a little bit. I didn't know until after the war was over, practically, that when we attacked that town, we had orders that there was 150 Germans holding the town, and we had about 170 men in our company. We hit that town against a little over 500 first-class uh, soldiers. They annihilated us. Well, right now, I'm wearing a ribbon over here of the French Front de Guerre because the French gave it to us because we the, we lost so many men. So we pulled out that night back to another town to reorganize, and the captain says, "Get all the men out and." you call for me to tell who I am and I want the, my men to come forward. Out of all those men that came forward, I had one out of 12 left. Hmm. And I, I, was just, I was just plain sick. And uh, so, uh, how, let's see how, oh yeah. I had to get men enough to fill the order and get two more machine guns. So I ordered them, the captain, he called it in to have them bring them out with the rations and ration for them, ammunition and everything. And I was afraid that those young boys, and most of them at them times was about 18 years old, I did not want them to see me bawling. I wish I could commit suicide. I wish I was dead. I wish I was home. And I didn't want to have me bawling in front of them. And it was a ladder went up the side from the living quarters into the hay lofts where their barns and hay malls are houses the same. I got up there and this was about 11.30. I presume it, I was bawling. I don't know. I sat up there and uh, I was just sick. I didn't want to see those guys. I didn't know how I was ever going to train them and, and what were we going to do, you know? And uh, way over in that corner was a light about that big around. And if you've seen a deer's light, a headlight or light on your headlights when you're out driving, it, that's how big a light that was. And that room was pitch dark. And I sat right there and I watched that, and that thing kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, you probably don't believe what I'm talking about, but that it got to be, oh, probably higher than that. And it was about that far across, snow white, but it was no light in that room whatsoever. So I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm about ready to lose it for sure. I reached down and pulled the 45 out and pulled it back. And, and, got her ready and she's loaded all I gotta do is snap the trigger whoever's carrying that and I sat there and I studied that and it blinked and I think I was crying the tears running on my face my hair standing on end and all of a sudden in that picture there stood Jesus Christ now I didn't see no features of a face because I know if you've read the Bible you don't don't see that closely he just stood there and oh man I, I mean I'm scared to death I'm shaking like a leaf and all of a sudden, just between you and me, he says, uh, Soldier, I'm going to tell you, you lead them and don't be afraid. And that light went down, took quite a while, and went clear back where it started from. It was nothing. Now there's nothing in there but me holding a 45. I, I will give you a little sentence that I said at church. I said, I'm probably the only man in the United States that pulled a pistol on the, pre on the Lord. But <laughs> I, I didn't know he was out. Well, anyway. So uh, 
I went downstairs and I got my men and I started teaching them. And the, and the runner said, you've got to have a letter written home, destroy all your mail, and be ready. We, we're going up and give the 45th a hand. They're, they're getting beat. So I did. And this one of these guys I got, just sitting there. He ain't doing nothing. I went over and said, hey, uh, Shield. I said, aren't you writing a letter? He looked up. I made two from the front of the He said, Sarge, I can't read nor write. I, what are you talking about? You're up this far? Yeah, he says, I got 21 letters in my, in my kit, in my cooking equipment there, from my mother that I've never opened. Oh, my God. So I sat down, and I took the last one he got, and I opened it up, and I read part of it to him. And I said, if you want me to, uh, I could write a note. I'm no letter writer, but I could let him know that you're still alive. Well, that tickled him, so I just made a note, and I did it. And... Uh, then all of a sudden the runner comes in and says, okay, now secure equipment, have it out on the road. The trucks will pick us up. We're going up and relieve the 45th Division. They're up the road about 10 miles. So we, we got in there. Now, what am I going to do with these guys? They, they don't know what to do. And I'm trying to talk to them. I've got to show them how to load that machine gun, how to unload it, and who's going to carry the ammunition. Well, anyway, we got up there, and all of a sudden a German mortar opened up, and they laid five shots, scattered all around. They, they didn't hit in on us, but they was all around us. And I'm all by myself. And one landed, oh, about that second chair, well, the first chair behind you, right in the ground. And it was about that big around, and it stuck up out of the ground about that high. It was kind of muddy in there where we were. And uh, uh oh, if delayed action's on that, I'm dead. And I waited, and it didn't blow. And I thought, well, maybe the guy out in Germany forgot to put the fuse in it. It hasn't blown up yet, and it's just as shiny as it was the minute it hit. And I'm, I'm trying to study it out. Well, I had a couple of guys holler. One of them was nicked a little bit. But I still concentrated on that shell. And uh, all of a sudden, I heard his voice. Sergeant, now do you believe? And to this day, that shell has never gone off, and I'm here. Man, you realize how many instances you've had where you came this close? Oh, he did a hundred of them. When you finally got back to the States, there was also a, a piece of mail that caught up with you. Talk to me about that. <laughs> yeah, we was sitting in the house and the mail would come, and I see he stopped down there, and, and Dad said, I'll get out and get it. No, I said, it's a package. I'll get out and get it. And so I went down, and I looked at it, and I come back, and I come in the house, and I told my mother, I said, here, here's something. The package has been after me. This package was sent to me in 19, well, it could have been the, the winter of 43. And that package took after me and went all over where I went, caught up with me on the ninth day of January of 46. And it was a fruit cake. It had been wrapped about five times and it weighed about like a uh, bowling ball. <laughs> Oh, uh, this has been unbelievable. Uh, you know, we've interviewed a lot of people, John, and this has been the most amazing revelation and story that you've told. So, uh, it's this is terrific. If I think it's 89th one issued since the Civil War, and in the book that I looked at, I don't know. It seems to me there's only only just a few in World War II. And in my, in my outfit, I think I was the only one that ever got one. The other guys had much, much, much harder fighting. I mean, that's why I'm no hero. I don't, I don't want no credit for nothing. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll give you credit. <laughs> you may not want it, but we'll give it to you. And we can't thank you enough, John, for sharing your story.